Good evening. I am Michael Brickhouse, Director of Alumni Relations at Duke Divinity School. On behalf of the Duke Alumni Association, the Duke Divinity School, Law School, School of Medicine, and Sanford School of Public Policy, I would like to welcome you to this evening's conversation, Being Human in the Age of AI. In this challenging season, we were able to take this planned live event and make it virtual for all of you to enjoy safely. For that, I would like to thank everyone who has made this evening possible. This conversation was designed with an interdisciplinary lens, seeking to address the ethical question, what it means to be human in a milieu of artificial intelligence and machine learning. This panel represents a small slice of the diverse range of Duke experts able to address this topic. After tonight, please look out for a follow-up email that will list some of the additional resources Duke has to offer. Finally, thanks to all of you who took the time to join us tonight. It is our hope that you will enjoy tonight's programming. I'll now turn it over to Dean Judith Kelly. Judith Kelly is the ITT Terry Sanford Professor of Public Policy and an expert in the field of international relations and Dean of the Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. Dean Kelly of Political Science earned her PhD and a Master of Public Policy degree at the Harvard Kennedy School and her BA at Stanford University. She joined the Sanford School faculty in 2002 and became Dean in July, 2018. Dean Kelly is a dual citizen of her native country, Denmark and the United States. And she is a proud Duke parent. I'll now turn it over to Dean Kelly. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, and welcome to all our audience members today. And I'm pleased to introduce our panelists starting with uh, Luke Bretherton. Luke Bretherton is the Robert E. Cushman Professor of Moral and Political Theology and a Senior Fellow of the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University. He's worked with a variety of faith-based NGOs, uh, mission agencies, churches around the world, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, he's written several books, including a book called Resurrecting Democracy, Faith, Citizenship, and the Politics of a Common Life. And that focuses on the themes, including the church's involvement in social welfare provision, the treatment of refugees, radical democracy, globalization, responses to poverty, and the patterns of interfaith uh, relations. His primary areas of research uh, are supervision and teaching, uh, uh, are Christian ethics and moral theology, the intellectual and social history of Christian political thought, political theology, the relationship between Christianity and capitalism, missiology, the practices of social, political, and economic witness. So welcome, Luke. And our next panelist that I would like to introduce for you is Morali Doriswamy. Uh, Dr. D, as I've also learned that he goes by, is a highly respected doctor, brain scientist, and health technology researcher at Duke University School of Medicine, where he serves as professor of psychiatry and medicine. He has served as a principal investigator on landmark clinical trials and played a key role in the development of many diagnostic, therapeutic, and mobile health innovations widely used in medicine today. Uh, Morali has led global efforts to develop ethical standards, uh, minimize biases, and generate evidence that we, can, uh, that we need to uh, deploy AI and digital technologies in several areas of health. He's been an advisor to leading government agencies, businesses, and advocacy groups, and served as the chair of the World Economic uh, Forum's Global Agenda Council on Brain Research. Welcome, Morali. Finally, uh, Jeff Ward from the Law School is the Associate Dean of Technology and Innovation 
and serves as the director of Duke's Center on Law and Technology, which coordinates Duke's leadership at the intersection of law and technology with programs such as the Duke uh, Law Tech Lab, a pre-accelerator for legal technology companies, and the Access Tech Tools Initiative, a program to help students and Duke's community partners to employ human-centered design thinking and available technologies to create tools to enhance access to legal services. Jeff focuses his scholarship and professional activities on the law and policy of emerging technologies, the future of lawyering, and the socioeconomic effects of rapid technological change. Uh, he has a focus on ensuring equitable access to the tools of economic growth and the resources of the law. Welcome, Jeff. So uh, before launching into my first question, I want to set the stage a little bit by providing just a couple of examples of recent developments in artificial, develop, de uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence that directly interface with human cognition. And these examples come from a podcast called Should This Exist? Uh, in case you are interested in hearing more about each of them. So the first example is, so what if your computer could read your face, could read your emotions? There's a company called Effectiva that is developing an AI tool that can detect universal emotions, such that your computer could react to how you're feeling. And that could make tech more human, but could it also invade our lives? Or another example, what would happen if we could have therapy without therapists. If we remove the human therapist from the therapy interaction, there is something called Wobot that uses artificial intelligence to just guide the user through a therapy session anytime, anywhere. And this could increase access to mental health and also reduce the stigma around uh, seeking therapy. No human therapist required. Or what if you could learn as fast as a kid again? Would you? There's a headset apparently now that you can get called Halo. And that can stimulate your brain as you're learning and be tailored to you. Right now, its use is limited to physical learning, such as athletes and musicians. But someday it could help anybody master anything. And would that be fair? Finally, I am speaking with my own voice tonight but apparently there's a tech that could change your voice to anything you want. I could be Michael Jackson if I wanted to. You can modulate. It could help people use a voice that represent who they think they, who they want to truly represent themselves to be. But what's real if you can't trust what you hear? So in these and many other ways, is artificial intelligence changing what it means to be human? So my first question, which I'll pose to all of our panelists, is if one of the features that defines us as humans is advanced intelligence, in what ways are our understandings of what it means to be human challenged by AI? Luke, I'm going to go first to you. Well, it's a delight to be with you all. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll kind of set up things. I, I'm, I'm sure Morelli and, and Jeff have much more kind of uh, detailed reflections on this, but as a kind of broad strokes um, to, to set the kind of reflections off, I think it really, this question depends on what you think it means to be human. So there's a kind of prior question, which this question is nested within. Um, so if you think of the human as a kind of calculating machine, and there's a long history of that going back to Descartes and others, we could trace it back to, um, or if you think of the human brain via the image of a computer, you're going to see AI as a rival. You're going to see that there's a problem here. If you imagine and narrate the human in terms of that we're desiring, storytelling, meaning and purposing animals, then you're not going to think AI is a rival. It's, it's going to remain within the, the realm of the tool rather than a, a kind of um, equivalent to a person. So, so there is this prior question of how do we imagine and narrate what it means to be human and how do we situate AI in relation to that? Um, I think AI does kind of shine a light on 
questions about the meaning and purpose of, of humanity and how we understand what it means to be a human. And we see that played out in philosophical debates around post-humanism and transhumanism and these ideas that you can kind of upload human consciousness uh, to, to the cloud and this kind of thing. Um, but I think they, that these are kind of question begging moves that actually should force us to ask more fundamental questions uh, of the meaning and purpose of the human. And that's, that's you know, we've got a millennia of debates around that and many precedents for, for, for thinking about that. So I, I don't think there's a kind of step change or point of rupture with previous uh, generations, but I think it, it, it does, AI does force us to ask these questions in kind of more salient ways and, in more, and presses them uh, in particular ways. Morali, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I really enjoyed what uh, Luke said. <clears throat> you know, um, about 150 years ago when Darwin came up with this uh, theory of evolution, you know, a lot of us were like pretty upset probably back then, you know, saying, how can it be possible? You know, apes are so different. And then genetics revealed that, you know, gorillas are only like 2% different from humans in terms of their genetics. And we said, oh, that's okay, you know, we still have our mind and our brain, as you pointed out, and that's what really separates us as humans. But computer intelligence is growing at such a fast rate, uh, and it's sort of beating humans or starting to beat humans in many of the areas that Luke mentioned. We thought emotion recognition was safe, but as you pointed out, Effectiva, and there are a number of programs out there that can recognize faces, that can recognize various types of emotions, even Alexa at some point can probably recognize your emotions because Amazon has this huge price uh, to make Alexa as sensitive to your emotions as any human. I think what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years is that you know, the Turing price is going to change, right? So the Turing price is how can we design a computer that is so human-like that you cannot tell the computer from a human? The next price is going to be, can we find a human that's so human that you know, a, a, cannot tell it apart from a computer. So, that, so being human like a human is going to become sort of a rare uh, event, I think. Jeff, do you uh, want to jump in here? Sure. I, I, I'm just excited to be here. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. And it's a really nice opening question as well. I, um, there's so many ways in which I think technological change challenges, as Luke said, our conception, it's another mirror to, to look back upon what we've been doing for, for millennia. Um, one way that I, that I tend to focus on kind of our cultural situation and one way that I think we've often understood ourselves, actually, let me give two ways and one that's positive and one that's negative in this change. A couple of ways we've understood ourselves to be human is part of socially stratified uh, cultures, right? And so I liked your, I, I wouldn't have said this before, but I liked your example of Wobot, right? And how you use that as example to, a, as access to an essential service, mental health services that uh, AI may provide that wasn't there before. So in some ways we could imagine that one challenge is that our highly stratified hierarchical sense of our place in this world uh, could be challenged by greater access and equity. And wouldn't that be wonderful? But I think a, 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 something that I feel more strongly about is that the, we've often understood our identity, our human identity as our place in a culture and, and it's intimately tied with work and profession and those kinds of things. And um, to go back to Morali's comment about you know, the development over time and what the increasing capacity, there was a time when we understood ourselves toiling in the fields as part of our identity and then machines came along, the steam engine, the cotton gin, et cetera, and radically changed our conception of ourselves there. And what we did was we narrowed the category of um, tasks that we said, oh, but this is what makes us human. Okay, a machine can you know, spin cotton or whatever, but now it's the, the tools of the mind. And then what happened is over time, we started to get AI and other tools that start to actually creep in that way. But we've said, oh, well, it might be able to replicate these routine tasks, but it's my empathy and my crea creativity that is what makes me human. And we keep moving into a narrower and narrower category. And if you don't mind, I'll tell a quick story. If you, if you haven't seen it, you already recommended the podcast. I'll recommend, recommend the documentary about AlphaGo. DeepMind, which was purchased by Google, I had a tool called AlphaGo and it played the game of Go, which is much more complex than chess, which was people probably know about DeepMind and Gary Kasparov, but it's this artful 
um, game that's been passed on over millennia, and it's more potential moves in the game than there are atoms in the universe. And they played this AlphaGo tool against Lee Settle, the, the world reigning champion in Go. And what's beautiful about the documentary is not only skip to the end, you know this from the very beginning, AlphaGo is going to win. Okay, sorry to ruin it. But the part that's beautiful about it is this moment when the AlphaGo machine starts to put stones on the board in a place where no human would ever do it. And in fact, the announcers, like these sport announcers say, oh my goodness, it's gone off the rails. It's, you know, it, this is it. No machine can beat Lee Settle, et cetera. But pretty soon, the accumulation of stones wipes Lee Settle off the board. And that very moment is a special moment that I hope everybody gets to see because what it is, is it's a demonstration of a machine teaching humans in a creative way that no human creativity had ever accessed yet. There's an element there of machine-driven creativity that I think teaches us that, that, that the way we understand ourselves to have a special set of skills that machines don't have access to is getting more and more challenging to hold on to. And so I think that's a fundamental challenge. Where will we draw that line in what differentiates us from the machines? So, just, I mean, just to quickly, just to jump, I think there's a wonderful point. And I think that points to the way in which the, the distinctiveness of the human and the distinctiveness of the machine and the ways human, uh, ways machines perceive and process is going to be different from how humans perceive and process. And we often conflate these two things or get anxious because they're, you know, we, 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 we insist on seeing them in, in, as equivalent or parallel. Um, and so I think there's an, an important way of differentiating. But I think there's also a sense in which, um, you know, the, the, the stories we tell about the human and about the responses to our environment. So kind of classic myths like Prometheus is a story which modern literature has used to think about its responses to technology. We steal fire uh, from the gods and through technology make ourselves more godlike and release ourselves from the world of necessity and the imprisonment of nature. And this is a story of machines enabling human transcendence and now does AI threaten that because they're gonna transcend us? Or is it Pandora? Uh, we, we open up a box of tricks which causes mayhem and havoc and in some ways, these I think it's it's not it's less the question of what it mean it means to be human, but more what are the kind of stories we think and live by? How do we make sense of the reality that that AI is bringing into being? And therefore, kind of how how as meaning making creatures, uh, we're actually interpreting the meaning of these things. And I think that's we we often get very anxious about kind of AI's arrival. I think we need to pay more attention in a sense to the stories we live by and the stories we situate AI within and therefore what kind of meaning and, and, and sense of purpose are those setting up for how we interpret this technology. Before going on to the, the other questions, I want to dwell a little bit more on this because this is the central question, right, of the, of the evening. Uh, in what ways it really challenges us to, uh, uh, what does it mean to be a human in the age? And so, so Morali and Jeff, I want to invite you to weigh in again on what Luke has said, but but a couple of things struck me on what you, what you said, Jeff, you referred to machine driven, right? And then and Luke starts to talk about, well, there's some point at which machines potentially drive themselves. But then Luke, you also talk about purpose. Uh, and I wonder, you know, can a, can a machine have a purpose? Uh, and, 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 or more ultimately, Luke, you're, you're from the divinity school. Can it have a, can it have a soul? Have a soul. Uh, so uh, Morali, I don't know, as a doctor, maybe you can tell us whether, um, <laughs> have souls. Have you seen any in the, your dissections? <laughs> well, I, I'm also a Hindu, so, uh, but, you know, I, I, instead of soul, let me talk about another neuroscience concept, which is called free will. Mm -hmm. you now, because free will could presumably be one other feature that distinguishes humans from a machine. And you might say, I have the free will as a human being to decide at any moment to do whatever I want. Um, but it turns out actually that free will might be a little bit more of an illusion. Uh, and there's a number of neuroscience studies that show that there are actually neurons in the brain that fire before you are knowingly aware of the action that you're going to take. And your smartphone in your pocket can probably predict where you're going to be within like, you know, a hundred meters, uh, you know, probably knows you better than most people in your family know you. So uh, I think the issue of free will 
could also be one of those chips that Jeff was mentioning might be knocked down. And so we might have to put ourselves in a smaller and smaller bucket. And talking about Wobot, you know, uh, yeah. So psychiatrists, you know, we thought we were so human that patients would prefer us because we have empathy. We have this complex decision-making skills where we can integrate the human nature of it. Uh, Oracle just did a survey about two weeks ago of 12,000 employees and 82% said they would prefer to talk to a robot than a therapist. I don't know if that's a reflection of psychiatry here or uh, you know, in this current era, but uh, I just want to tell you, even that has been chipped away. Interesting. Jeff, any, any last thought on this topic before I move well, maybe, on? Maybe one quick thought that ties together both Morali and Luke's. I mean, I, back to this kind of reflection upon us. I mean, I do think that as technology moves, we rethink the way we've understood ourselves. And so you also mentioned affectiva, which is this uh, notion of, um, uh, you know, can we know, can we empathize, right? Can a machine empathize? And, and that question can be changed and it's say, well, what does it teach us about what, the way we empathize? And we've often associated that with something like soul or human connection. And you know, both those things might be right, but it's also pupil dilation, right? Our perceptions of uh, imperceptible heat changes in people's bodies and the dilation of their pupils, et cetera, things that could be mechanized. And, and that does change in the same way that a conception of free will might be explained by neurological, you know, neur neuron firings. Um, it challenges us to better understand ourselves. And I don't, I'm not trying to take away a special place for us, but I do think it's important to be honest with what's actually going on when we do something like empath uh, empathize or uh, make a, a free choice, right? And, um, and oftentimes these things are more uh, mechanical, chemical than we've uh, previously acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do want to just push back a, a little bit. I think one of the, um, so in, in kind of classical Greek philosophy and in Christian theology, the notion of anima or soul isn't some hidden, you know, mystical bit floating somewhere in the body. It's the idea that we're psychosomatic holes uh, who, and, and it's the kind of combination of will, desire uh, and, a, and agency. So it's, it's just a way of talking about the ability to act uh, as a psychosomatic whole. So there's nothing kind of mystical about it. And so I think that we're running into a problem when we kind of have this knockdown theory of bits of distinctly human things like will or language or tool making, i.e. they're trying to separate out a specific category and then load that with what it means to be human. The, the, the more ancient idea encompassing the notion of anima is that we are psychosomatic cults as a physical, willing, desiring unity of being. And a machine, you know, or an AI is never going to be that because it doesn't have a body in that sense. It, of, and it doesn't have that kind of, um, we might even talk about it as a kind of emergent set of properties that come through being this particular kind of animal. Um, and so I think that we, we get confused when we try and, and, and kind of locate one specific area or thing as the human language will, whatever. And we just need to think of ourselves, we're, you know, we're fleshly, sweaty, flatulent bodies uh, that can do certain kinds of things. And when we think about ourselves in those terms, like we don't get confused that we're, we have anything machine-like about us. Um, so I just think we need to have a more humble, uh, kind of attend to our sweat glands and we'll probably keep a sense of perspective. As long as we don't get uh, flatulent machines. Then. <laughs> so uh, so I, I want to, we can we can continue to reflect on this theme throughout the, uh, the the discussion, but I want to move on to talking a little bit more about uh, about health, both mental and and physical of humans, because we we've been talking about things that machines might be able to do that make them more like us, but there are also lots of ways in which machines and AI is being applied to help humans uh, who could be assistant in various ways, either to en enhance capacities or to to replace capacities that might be, uh, you know, absent due to injury or other other reasons, or even something like I was thinking the Activa Jeff, you could imagine um, uh, people who have a hard time reading other people's emotions uh, benefiting from something like this. So, so Morali, uh, Morali is is AI enhancing health and well-being, and and, and if so, uh, are there any risks from from AI when we are applying them to health? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, AI is starting to enhance health and has a huge potential uh, to enhance health. 
I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. Uh, we're all in the midst of a pandemic, right, COVID? So um, would you like to know 72 hours before you actually develop COVID symptoms that you are going to develop COVID symptoms? And would that be so useful? Because you could isolate yourself, you could take precautionary measures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of studies now that have shown that an AI powered smartwatch can actually detect with almost 85, 90% accuracy based on variations in your heart rate and a few other metrics. So that's one example. The second example is, you know, there are, I don't know, maybe like 50,000 publications on COVID that have been published since the pandemic began. No human doctor could ever digest all of those articles and come up with any meaningful conclusion, whereas an AI program can. And, and, and so this is being applied in multiple ways throughout medicine. And I'll just give you an example. Um, so humans obviously are, human doctors are slow. Um, they make errors. The average doctor maybe you know, spends about seven, eight minutes seeing a patient uh, in a busy hospital. So that's what we call shallow medicine, right? So hopefully with AI, you know, the machines are very fast. They can be standardized. They make fewer errors. Would you rather have a neuro, I mean, I like neurosurgeons, but would you rather have a neurosurgeon with a tremor operating on you? Or would you rather have a machine that is so precise and it operates with something called the eye knife the eye knife not only is able to make a very precise incision, it can biopsy the tissue, it can immediately tell what the pathology of the tissue is, and it can scan your computer and read 5,000 articles on a particular brain tumor and, and make some decision that pops up on the computer screen. So clearly, I think for decision support purposes, for treatment purposes, for a variety of sort of synthesizing information type purposes, it's going to be enormously useful. Now, the risks, of course, are not of the AI. Uh, to me, you know, there's this old saying, I'm not afraid of AI, I'm afraid of the human being programming the AI. So how good was the evidence? How well sort of what is it tested? Are there biases? Are there privacy leaks? And last but not least, is there a black box algorithm that we don't understand? So these are some examples of uh, some of the risks. And yes, of course, you write a bad line of code, you can kill someone. What, what do you think, uh, Luke? Is, is human flourishing possible with AI? Um, you know, we have examples now in Japan, for example, I know of, 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 of uh, robots keeping um, elderly people in particular company. So flourishing, not just in the medical sense, but in the mental sense as well. And yeah, no, I think, I think you know, uh, in a sense, um, is human flourishing possible with AI? Of course. And Morales gave us some wonderful examples how it can contribute and we can multiply those exponentially. Um, and, and so this question is, but I think there is a broader question when we look at it in the round, uh, is AI contributing, will it contribute? We're kind of trying to make a prediction. Um, will it contribute or not? And here, I think we have to think through it's kind of three points of kind of drawing out from philosophy of technology, kind of the question of affordances, the, the question of inferences, if you like, and the question of agency. Um, and so we, we tend to, um, in kind of popular culture, we have this view that, um, you know, guns don't do bad things. Uh, it's people who do bad things with guns, i.e. Te technology is neutral. It's the user that which causes the problem um, on the one hand, or we, we have this kind of very deterministic view of technology uh, and you get it like there was a kind of very clunky history that somehow the stirrup caused feudalism or the clock generated capitalism. So technological developments change human consciousness and uh, technology philosophy of technology has kind of moved on from both of those and we, we have this notion of affordances that um, technologies don't necessarily uh, uh, kind of tell you what to do with them but they do have drifts kind of directions of travel so um, and uh, uh, and they kind of make they invite certain kinds of responses to themselves. So we have to think about what kinds of responses, what kind of uh, drift does AI tend to? The other aspect is, some, is what we might call kind of inferences. Um, and this is a kind of cultural anthropology idea. Uh, you know, if I take AI as a technology, it doesn't operate by itself. It, it is always situated in a culture and in a political economy. Um, and so if we look at our political economy and our culture, you know, it's a consumerist culture, 
It's uh, got heavy concentrations of power in the state, um, heavy concentrations of power in monopoly capitalism, things like Google. How is AI likely to be read in this kind of political economy and in, in this kind of culture? And then is it going to enhance agency? Is it going to create more distributed structures, uh, more peer-to-peer -peer governance? Is it going to enhance democratization or not? And I think on all those fronts, um, so to give you one example outside of this, if you think about a nuclear power station or a coal-fired power station. Um, that inherently demands massive concentrations of power. Uh, it requires kind of states to build a nuclear power or state back structures. So it, it inherently concentrates power, uh, it, both political and economic power. Um, is AI going to be more like a nuclear power station or is it going to be more like the humble mobile phone, not smartphones, but humble mo mobile phones, which, you know, if we look in Africa, they've radically enhanced agency of lots of people of access to banking and health and, and, and been a, a generally a, a boom um, in communication and, and enabled democratization. So we have these the reception of technologies and, and the kinds of things they 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 generate. Um, I think the kind of early reports in are not great. Um, you know, so it, it, in this kind of culture, in this kind of political economy, and with the affordances of AI, it does seem to lend itself to forms of surveillance capitalism and concentrations of economic power, and uh, and Google would be an example and concentrations of state power, social credit system in China being an obvious example of that. And so I think now that AI doesn't have to be used that, I think the problem when we stack up the affordances, the inferences and, the, and how, it's in, how these are impacting agency, what AI, the challenges it poses is over and against its own affordances, it, it demands a huge amount of intentionality and counter design uh, to ensure it does enable human flourishing and increase agency and increase democratization. My own view, and, and Morali and Jeff might have different views on this, I, I, you know, be interested to, 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 to hear, is I, I think it does tend away from, at the, the level of political economy and, and, and can culture, away from enhancing human flourishing as it stands because of those contextual and, and affordances issues. Um, but that's just my, that's my view. So, so we'll ask Murali about this in a second, but I want to ask Jeff because Jeff, um, Luke has, has opened up not one, but two, but multiple cans of ethical worms <laughs> here. And, and so the obvious question then is who should be monitoring? Uh, the, uh, who should be providing the ethical supervision? I mean, I would start by, I, you know, 15 minutes before the session, Judith, I, I just finished teaching the last session of my Frontier AI and Robotics Law and Ethics class. Mm -hmm. And I really should have just had them listen to Luke's last three minutes because he wrapped up pretty much everything I hope they walk away with. So nicely said, I couldn't agree more. And I, I especially agree, and this connects to your question, with that kind of epic intentionality that's needed in order to um, counter these drifts. So, you know, uh, science and technology philosophers and others like Sheila Jasanoff will say, not only is there a fallacy of technological determinism, as if it marches on on its own, and that for, therefore our role in its development is diminished. That's a fallacy. We have a role. She also talks about the myth of technocracy. Uh, and this gets to your question. I think we, we assume, particularly with complex topics, and you, you know, people's eyes when you say machine learning will, you know, will glaze over and say, oh my gosh, that's, that's for a special breed of human being to deal with and that's not me, right? They, th they think that it's not for them. And I think that's really dangerous because the answer to your question then, Judith, becomes not me, it's the technologist. And, and I would argue that we're ceding a tremendous amount of power to technologists. So we already have the concentrating forces that Luke so you know, articulately expressed. And on top of that, we have the sophistication and perception of um, sophistication and te technocracy that re requires a certain person. And I would argue so strongly it takes everybody because ev every AI system and machine learning system is situated in a context, as Luke said, I, I call these socio-technical systems. And we never talk about uh, a, a, an algorithmic system, always an, al you know, or an algorithm, an algorithmic system, always. And an example would be, you know, Dr. D, needs to be part of uh, a, uh, a system that's trying to diagnose diabetic retinopathy, right? Because he's gonna make sure that 
even if the overall um, uh, optimization you know, moves from 89% accuracy to 94, that there's not a subgroup that actually moves from you know, uh, 89% down to 48% or something so that there's some group that totally misses. In, it, in that domain, maybe accuracy and non-bias are our highest values. And he understands that because he's boots on the ground in that medical field. Move over to uh, something that's more legal in nature like uh, credit determinations or um, what makes the news like sentencing, uh, you know, algorithms that help set. There, it's not only non-bias, which is important, accuracy is important, explainability in terms of intuitive explainability is required under our conceptions of due process. So there we have other experts that need to be part of building that process. So that kind of epic intentionality requires that the answer to your question be everybody, not just the technologists. If there are technolog technological problems, we can't assume that there are technological <laughs> solutions. It needs to be everybody. And I would add one additional um, uh, element to that, that it can't just be professionals like us either. I think it's really important that we not bring to bear on this an assumption that it's people of privilege who can, who can be ad adequately representative uh, of all the stakeholders involved, but we need to find new ways to, to build round tables that can bring all stakeholders, all communities to this uh, and engage in AI development. That would be my, uh, my very strong feeling. And again, Luke, I wish you would have just given the last three minute talk to my class. That was excellent. <laughs> um, judging from the amount of head nodding that I saw both by Luke and, and, and you, Morali, uh, rather than have you repeat the excellent answer that Jeff gave, I think I want to move on in our discussion. Uh, I just can I just one quick no, question because no, no, okay, no, okay, no, because I'm moving on. <laughs> uh, because the next question I think is really interesting too. I want to get make sure I get to it. So um, you know, we asked at the beginning what what does it what does it mean to be human in the age of AI? And we talked about us as human. What does it mean for us to function as human and how machines differ from, from us, etc. But but what about when we start thinking about a real realities that are created by AI? So AI can now write stories by themselves. Um, we have virtual reality that can be enhanced and you can have experience of reality that's not a reality. And this sort of takes me into the question of the whole notion of facts uh, and truth and reality. So what does that mean? So Luke, now I will let you say something. And if you want to go back to the prior topic, you may do so. But if I have enticed you enough with a new topic, you can stick to that. <laughs> I'm thoroughly enticed. I'll get engaged with the question. Um, yeah, no, I think this is a really interesting question. And I think they, I mean, Jeff's already touched on it in, in terms of issues of bias and impartiality. Um, and we see that, you know, whether it's issues of sentencing, predictive pol policing, hospital admissions policies, the ways in, you know, the, the data that's put in and the biases that get baked in. I've, I've been particularly interested in questions around credit scores and credit decisions and how these, the data it builds on action. And Margaret, who has a great article on this talking about algorithmic Jim Crow and, Luke, and how you see- uh, Luke, predictive policing, just by audience being when police is using uh, artificial intelligence to predict where what neighborhood crime crime spots happen so where you uh, and that will build on prior data sets and we know certain communities are over policed and therefore just replicates that over policing but part of the problem and this is a good example it takes on the sheen of neutrality uh, and therefore it appears more factual and here we you know and this is a, a good again modern philosophical problem that that is kind of baked into the university system and baked into how we tend to think about these things of a fact value distinction and so we tend to think oh well that's just a fact and then i'll impose my value on it and we don't see how the creation of the fact is actually resting on all sorts of prior values whether that's prior credit making decisions prior policing structures prior hospital admissions policies wh whatever it is and so i think there's that problem around how facts the, the kinds of what gets kind of put out as factual because of the ways we absorb and approach technology hides all sorts of biases. So that, that's one set of kind of questions. I think there's another uh, set of questions um, around on the, uh, one of which is the uh, um, kind of question of if you talk about truth. What if we substituted the word truth for wisdom? Um, and what, how does AI enhance wisdom or not? And here, I think we face a very tricky issue, and again, it's a kind of affordances issue of, um, and you see it, a, a good example is the use of Google Maps, very kind of common uh, uh, use. 
um, my mother was complaining about her niece, uh, to, uh, my niece to, to, to me, um, that she went somewhere, stayed there for a week and had no idea where she was. She just punched in the address in Google Maps and they had no consciousness of the kind of county of England. It was in, my mother's obsessed with counties of England, but the, it, the ways in which AI is designed to lead to a more frictionless passage through the world and is supposed to make you not have to pay attention not have to use your critical faculties, not have to learn the route and, the, and develop the memory to do that. And so the affordances of the technology generate a lack of attention, a, in a sense, a lack of wisdom creation and, and, and habitual practices of coming to make wise judgments and discernments and discriminations. And so I think that's a much more tricky issue to get at. I think it's one that plagues a lot of technologies um, and, and how they're designed and how we experience them. But I think it's particularly pressing in AI where we're using it to replace human decision-making and, and therefore our ability to discriminate when should an AI being, be, be, be deployed or not and, and what kinds of ways in which does AI um, undoes our ability to make wise judgments in the round. So not only may technology be able to produce its own versions of reality, but also by depending on it, we become less capable of discerning the differences. Yeah. And so I think exactly in, as we've seen in the current election cycle and, and prior to that, 2016, when you have processes where we're essentially outsourcing decision making, and we're increasingly through the tech, you know, if I can just rely on Siri to come, you know, hold my memory, then I'm, I'm, my ability to, to decipher and discern, um, is this a factual statement? Is this a true statement? Um, uh, I, and, and the only way to do that in the current kind of environment is, you know, you have to chase down sources. You have to make quite subtle judgments about new sources, about, does that feel right when that spam email comes in? Is that is that kind of from someone in my firm or is that a fake thing? And, and we use all sorts of peripheral and intuitive and ways of knowing. But if we're over reliant on technology, we, we kind of unlearn, we de-skill. Technology can de-skill us from being able to make wise judgments. And I think that's a, it's a more subtle issue, but I think a more profound issue on this question of fact and truth. We're, we're, what AI demands of us is a greater ability to discern, and yet the very technology itself kind of de-skills us from the very processes of being able to make those discernments. Jeff, facts and truth. Judith, if I may add something, I'm, sure. I'm going to take Luke's uh, argument to one next level. In fact, it's great to see a <laughs> professor of theology at a neuroscientist agree, so that's great. So if you take Luke's argument to one next level, so, okay, so basically, the, the, uh, the theory would be humans are going to get dumber in some ways. We're not getting wiser because um, uh, you know, facts are being sort of chosen for us and we are not paying as much attention and we don't have the ability to discern and go deep. And then if the genes select for that trait, then successive generations will become dumber and dumber and dumber. So I'm just taking this to a hypothetical next level. So we could end up with a very dumb human race uh, down the road. And in fact, there was a neuroscientist who uh, wrote a very provocative editorial uh, on exactly this topic, saying that with the advent of machines, you know, in the old days, people with lower abilities couldn't survive. They were less likely to be chosen as mates, but now a Instagram influencer could be like the most attractive mate ever. Jeff, did you have a comment on facts and truth? Yeah, I mean, I think this is on everybody's mind right now. It's a great question because of the of the election and, and disinformation sure. is is such is plaguing us. And you know, if if you look at effective machine learning itself, deep neural networks, about ten or eleven years ago when they started to get effective, there was a good gap of five years where there were almost no academic papers on bias. We've all mentioned bias here, and in the last years, if you look, there's been an upshot. Everybody's trying to catch up. If you look back five years ago to generative adversarial networks, the Ian Goodfellow paper, which really uh, was, was some of the primary science behind 
these fake digital artifacts, Judith, that you're alluding to, the fact that we can send out into the world, or GPT-3, which is a new technology that, uh, this, that's really producing text in that way. We haven't caught up yet. We don't, the, the answer to your question, we're struggling to figure out how do we do that. I, on the faith side of it, or like my, my optimism side, you know, there's the you know, Masaccio's Holy Trinity hanging in the back of the church. The apoc I'm sure apocryphal stories were that people thought Jesus was behind the altar because they'd never seen double point linear perspective before. We caught up to that with the Renaissance. When I uh, went and saw um, uh, the, uh, what's the movie, the, the found movie, uh, the Blair Witch Project, I remember being freaked out with my wife thinking, oh my gosh, they found this video and these people were murdered in Pennsylvania. 20 minutes later, I understood found video and I had the wherewithal to discern it's getting harder and harder, but I do think, I do believe in a human capacity to discern truth real from unreal, but it's getting harder. And it actually, I think goes back to the intentionality comment. It's, mm -hmm. it's happening so fast. We have to be deliberate, deliberate in giving tools back to ourselves in ways that we can discern what's a fake versus what's a real digital artifact. Because the, the risk is not just that we make mistake on one particular set of facts, it's that we lose the ability to trust overall and we feel the need to question. And once we have a lack of shared truth or the ability to reach a shared truth, a common truth, I worry about our ability to form communities, democracies, et cetera. And so there's a real risk here, I think, with the power of generative tools to create fake digital artifacts. And we need to be, again, very intentional, deliberate, and, and aggressive about giving ourselves the wherewithal to discern. So. Thanks. If we have if we have time, we'll return to this question of democracy lately, since us and so many people's mind. But uh, Morali, I'm supposed to ask you a question next, and uh, about um, whether or not you believe that AI will overtake the human brain and human IQ. But I'm now wondering, given the previous comments, whether maybe AI just needs to stand still and just wait for us to get dumber than it. But regardless, you can you can take the question in in either format. Uh, is it going to get out ahead of humans is, is the basic premise of the question. And, and I think well, fear that, like, you know, your basic science, science fiction writer has always been uh, uh, writing plots about. So the answer to that question depends on how you define the task or the challenge at hand. So obviously for narrow tasks, AI can already beat us, right? A calculator can beat us, a computer can perform 10 billion calculations, human mind cannot even approach uh, any of that. Um, and interestingly enough, the standard IQ test, which humans have valued for a long time, uh, if you look over the last 100 years or so, human IQ has gone up by about 20 points. Um, and the prediction is over the next 40 years, it'll only go up by about four or five points because we have already maxed out nutritional gains, uh, educational gains, all of those gains uh, that happened over the last century. Now, the Chinese have developed an AI program um, that can beat a segment of humans on the standard IQ test already. So if you're just measuring IQ as IQ, they can beat it. Whether a machine will develop what's called as general intelligence, um, I have no idea when that will happen. Uh, if you listen to Elon Musk, he predicts in the next 30, 40 years, it'll happen and we're all gonna be slaves. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure uh, that it will happen because humans are programming AI in their own image. So it's unlikely to. And my prediction is that in the next 20, 30 years, we'll change the definition of AI so that it'll no longer be just human AI, but it'll be human plus machine. So an augmented AI will be the measure of human AI that we will use. Interesting. So I'm going to uh, switch a little bit since we have our alums with us today and they're all um, uh, sort of putting back, back on their student hats and thinking about the student days. So, uh, so I want to ask you how each of you are all um, teaching and training students to prepare for this age of, uh, of, of AI. And I want to combine that with a question we got from an audience uh, member in advance, asking whether or not there's a greater role now more than ever for a liberal and humanities-based education uh, for our students or theology-based education for our students. Uh, so um, who wants to go first on that? I wouldn't mind starting. I, I love that question. And so whoever sent that in, thank you so much. I, um, I, going back to where Michael started us off about this interdisciplinary lens, I think one of the answers to that question is that almost none of these questions, if you take serious that notion of socio-technical system, can be answered by one discipline. You have to have you know, medicine and, and divinity speaking to each other. You have to have law, public policy, and philosophy speaking to each other. 
I think that's essential. The other is that um, on the humanities, I talk incessantly to the point that my students are probably so sick of it about the narrative imagination. Here I am, I teach at a law school on a technical subject and all, we talk all the time about narrative imagination and we bring in the arts, we bring in, we start the whole semester with a short story. I mean, I, I don't understand how we can prepare ourselves for a rapidly emerging future without a really robust ability to imagine many paths forward, to do so creatively and to do so in ways that engage all of our human sensibilities. And so the arts for me, the humanities, asking questions about what it means to be human, uh, these are absolutely essential to our ethical decision-making going forward in the ways that we put demands on our technology. So I see a huge role. I think the walls of our institution, which are already so low and allow us to work together and do things like this together, need to almost go totally away. We need to find uh, new ways to um, enhance that interdisciplinarity and think about problem solving over teaching a discipline. And I think we're well on our way to that. I think we're way ahead of other universities, to be honest, in a, in a lot of ways, uh, but I believe very strongly in it, so. Excellent. Morali, do you have a thoughts on this question? Um, I think we need to make medicine more human. So definitely the humanities are going to be essential for medical students and doctors. Um, they uh, are so busy and so caught up in technology that they forget that you're there to treat the person and not the disease. I would love to embed every healthcare AI startup with a humanities student or have a humanities person certify it saying this AI is sort of meets the criteria. Luke? So, uh, this is, uh, I have to say that humanities always has this kind of huge anxiety problem in, in the university. So this is this is just my, my, my soul is glowing at this the importance of humanities. But I, I mean, I, I just completely agree with that. It's a great story of, of a robot. Um, I was, they were uh, designed, Sandra was designing, in, designing and they put it into a, a, a mall in, in California and it was designed to avoid children. Um, and of course, you know, children being children, they want to chase art. You, if you move away and it's a, it's a robot, that's super cool. They want to play with it. And then the robot would move away and then the children would chase after it. And eventually they cornered it and the robot topples over and kind of hurts one of the children. There's a law case. And it's what a classic kind of classic case of, you know, if, if an anthropologist or, or a child psychologist had been in the room and said, you know, perhaps in your design phase, you want to design it as a playful artifact that's actually going to keep children a lot safer than if you kind of, um, you know, have, have this slightly anemic view of how, how it operates. So I think there are many examples of, of, of where folk in the in design stages and training and imagining could, could benefit from the humanities, uh, whether it's kind of historical consciousness or um, uh, anthropology or questions about, you know, theology and philosophy, meaning and purpose. Um, but I think also going back to what we've said before, the, the question of a kind of technological literacy and how folk in the humanities, um, not just it can help with humanities research, but uh, actually need to cultivate an imagination um, and, and an illiteracy about, uh, about technology. So precisely these questions of governance, precisely um, a kind of more distributed and inclusive decision-making. We, we have educated folk who, who are able to make um, the kind of interventions in these kinds of debates in an informed way. So I think the traffic needs to, to go um, both ways. I think the other thing to say is, um, in, you know, the humanities, and, and as we're training, um, often, it, and, in, and I get that at a, a university like Duke, the kind of drive to build up your CV, the drive to get work, and we're in, in classic kind of uh, uh, monastic terms, we're very much a vita activa, you know, it's the active life, we get meaning and purpose through action and through achievement. And, and I think there is actually a need to recover the kind of vita content lever, the, the contemplative life, and actually take these moments, whether it's in the design process, whether it's in decisions about policy, whether it's in um, uh, uh, kind of judgments about should this be an area of decision making where AI can take over for uh, kind of moments of heightened attention and contemplation. Um, I don't think that's something very, the university per se does very well, and we're not very good at it in the Divinity School either, we try and do a bit of that. But I think that is gonna become an increasing need across all disciplines of how do we cultivate habits of attention and contemplation 
beyond the demand of the bottom line or beyond the demand of the next thing. Um, because that actually is crucial to this kind of wise judgment making, which I think is central, given the power of these tools um, and, and how quickly they can go wrong and, or, or make you know, life a lot worse or, or the, their ability to make life better. Um, so I think that's one that would be my kind of plea. Um, and, and there are huge, you know, many religious practices, many philosophical practices, which could, we could draw on to think about that. But I think training folk to, uh, to take time to kind of pause and contemplate in amongst the rush of activity is kind of counterintuitive to a technocratic, technologically driven society, but I think will become increasingly important. So gentlemen, um, the clock is ticking and we're just barely getting going, uh, but I want to give, so Luke has had a chance to make his plea here at the end. So Jeff, uh, you have one minute to make your plea and Morali, you will have one minute to make your plea. I'm just going to hijack what my students just told me in my last class because they're always smarter than I. So uh, that is that they, we need to find ways to make well-being, uh, the kind of values that are articulated by the IEEE and other organizations around AI development, part of company culture and part of company incentives. Um, they determined that that's quite antithetical to a lot of the current shareholder primacy and others that, uh, that determine decisions of these big companies that have an increasing role in our lives, even our speech, our, our public square is often determined by platform technologies and we need to, to find ways to make human well-being uh, a part of that. Thank you, Jeff. Morali? Just gonna say two sentences. As a society, we need to invest in the humanities. We also need to invest in brain science because I, I think the answers are gonna come from both. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, my plea to uh, all the people who have been joining us is to uh, that you will uh, continue to remember your home institution, Duke University, and uh, join events that are being put on by the Duke Alumni Association. I want to thank everybody in the Duke Alumni Association uh, and uh, the, uh, our partners around the school, uh, the different schools who've helped put on uh, tonight's event. And I'm going to hand it over now to Susan uh, James from the Sanford School of Public Policy. Susan. Thank you. I'm Susan George James, Duke Class of 1990, an Assistant Director of Development and Alumni Relations at the Sanford School of Public Policy. As you said, thank you to the Duke Alumni Association, the Duke Divinity School, the Law School, School of Medicine, and the Sanford School of Public Policy for bringing this evening's conversation to more than 500 of our undergraduate and graduate and professional school alumni. Thank you, Dean Kelly, for being such a deaf moderator, and to Luke Bretherton, Morali Duraswamy, and Jeff Ward for sharing your expertise with us this evening. As Michael mentioned earlier, this panel represents a small slice of the diverse range of Duke experts able to address this topic. Look for more Duke resources in a follow-up email tomorrow. And finally, thanks to all of you who took the time to send in your questions for our program and for joining us this evening. As we head into the holidays, we wish you and yours a safe and healthy holiday season. Thank you. <laughs>